Come on, let's let's give it up for Black Moon, please. Thank you. All right, thank you, gentlemen, for being here. To talk about uh, Enter the Stage, which, uh, you know, as I said a few minutes ago, uh, really very important album in the history of hip hop. Um, you know, maybe folks who weren't around at the time in 1993 don't necessarily understand the impact of this album. Um, they may just know it as great music, but I think it's a lot more than that. And maybe you guys can, you know, as we start out, just talk about what you think the significance of the album is. Don't be shy. Come on. We, we do this all the time. No, we, <laughs> well, yo, I think that um, when we put the album together, a lot of uh, hard work and, and, and dedication and, and, and passion was uh, put into that. You know what I'm saying? And we didn't know, well, I didn't know that it would have an impact that it has had over the years since we put out the album. You know, that's I'm real grateful for that, you know. Um, I mean, when when we did, when we... Um, we did the album in 1993. That's when the album came out. The album came out in '93. Um, before that was uh, was the single "Who Got the Props," and um, for for that time, uh, the word "independent" probably just was so far from even thought of. You know, uh, there were a few independents out there, but to make the impact that a major um, made was def definitely not put on the map really at that time. So when we came out with Who Got the Props, um, no one knew who we were. They didn't know what label we came out of. They didn't know, you know, things of that nature. So um, they just knew they liked this record, Who Got the Props, and a lot of people played it. And that was cool for us because it put us on a, on a pedestal where um, as long as you have good music, then you could definitely achieve what you need to achieve. And then later, uh, Into the Stage was made on the same independent album, I mean, on the same independent label. So it was a, it was a, a real good significance at the time for hip hop because uh, primarily it was known for just having major labels, you know, and if it was independent, like Cold Chillin' and all that stuff, they were still through Warner Brothers, you know. Right. We was through a house label straight up and down, right. period. <clears throat> right, yeah, because tell everybody who may not know, Nervous was not known for hip hop at all at the time. Nah, Nervous was known for, um, house music and disco classics. Like they had Nervous slash they had Sam Records. And Sam Records put out a lot of classic joints, you know, like the Evasions and um, the Breakbeat I Can't Stop, you know. So that's what they was known for. Yeah, a lot of disco and boogie and stuff like that. Yeah. It wasn't like Michael uh, who, who ran the label. He, his family was in the business. Yeah, from Michael Weiss and um, his father, um, Sam Weiss. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, the Weisses right. were pretty yeah. famous. <laughs> Actually, like Barry Weiss... Is still the uh, owner of Jive Records. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So the, the Weisses were, you know, were players in the music industry. Right. Um, and we were just, we was fortunate to get a record deal mm -hmm. <laughs> at the time by Michael Weiss, but like that. Yeah. Now, can you talk a little bit about just what the importance of this album is to New York? Because, you know, from my recollection, circa like 92 or so, you know, it was pretty much all, you know, West Coast. The Chronic had come out, and you know Snoop was about to drop as well, and um, it was, you know, the the stigma about New York was well they make okay records, but they're more artsy or they're you know um, more on like the native tongues tip or something like that. Whereas you know this album came out and had a real power to it. I mean, when this album came out. You know, when, when Into the Stage came out, it, it, it embodied the personality and the, and the people that made it, which is us as, a, you know, Evil D, 5FT, and myself. Um, when you put all of us together as a, as a unit, you get the elements that was in the album because, you know, E being heavily influenced by old records, you know what I'm saying, old funk, old jazz loops, and stuff like that, and... Um, uh, 5FT, you know what I'm saying, and myself uh, being prior dancers before yeah. picking up a microphone. So we was absorbed by the music <clears throat> for a very long time. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I think the uh, 
you know, I could go and recollect when my moms had uh, two turntables and a mic in the house when I was like seven, six years old with the speakers and the crates. You know what I'm saying? So being embodied into that element and growing up into that element and appreciating music, period, you know, having the opportunity to be a part of hip hop and express it at that level is 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 is, is, is extraordinary. See, and it's fu see, it's funny because a lot of people say like the New York vibe at the time, like when they say that an artsy or whatever, like the West Coast music came out, it was pure gangster, you know, street gangster, yo, straight up and down, you know, uh, bang music, you know what I mean? And then people were saying New York music is is primarily known for like they was they would they would they would associate more tribe and de la. Uh, to New York because they would say New York is that quote unquote conscious stuff, you know, and we we do more unconscious stuff, you know. That gangster stuff is more con unconscious, you know. Um, so when Black Moon came out, when, when, when Black Moon came out, went into the stage, it really changed the playing field because as an individual, I'm, I embody everything, you know. Say I come from Franklin Avenue. We all come from the hood, you know. what I'm saying, um, grew up. On the block, grew up in different parts of Brooklyn, Coney Island, Franklin Avenue, Bushwick, Brownsville, Bushwick, East, yeah, New, Bush, York, East New York, you know. And then at the same time, we conscious because we grew up in an Islamic environment as well, you know what I'm saying? Right. At the same time, we culturally and in, in, in conscious. So we put all that in our music and we fought back with the attitude of when you listen to End of the Stage, you hear consciousness, you hear street stuff, you know what I'm saying? Street, hardcore. Dudes that don't play conscious, aware, and positive at the same time. So we set out a different message that we positive dudes that don't play no games. That's the that's the bottom line. You know what I'm saying? And that was that was really the the truth of how we are. So right. we universal. You know what I'm saying? Right. One thing I wanted to say is how I'm like <clears throat> putting the album together. Basically, uh, you know, like my thing is like from the music side, like they did all the lyrics. Um, me and Mr. Walt did the beats, and basically, like, you know, my thing with the beats was, okay, you know, the West, you know, me, tra you know, I traveled, I used to go to the West Coast in the um, summer times to go stay with my aunt, and um, it's like the West is laid back, and it's all about funk, and that's showed in their music. Over here, we on the trains, it's crowded. <clears throat> you know what I'm saying? We got, we hitting the concrete, we doing what we got to do. And that's what, one of the things that was put, you know, put into, into, you know, into the music and everything. Our everyday lifestyle, everyday function, you know what I'm right. saying? Like, yo, I was on the train with my Walkman listening to, you know, whatever was rocking at the time. And then I would go home and be like, okay, I heard uh, Gangstar. Uh, just to get a rep is crazy. Or this record is crazy. And then I would go to, um, what was that? It was a party back in the days where they used to play the beats. Um, Soul Kitchen. Soul Kitchen. They'd go hang out at Soul Kitchen, then leave Soul Kitchen, go to D&D. &D. No, at the time it was Calliope. Go to Calliope and then work on the beats. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, my brother, Walt, he made his beats. He, like me, I make my beats on the spot. Mr. Walt had to make, he made his beats at home. He, you know, like with me, I like the pressure. I like like when Buck and Five walk in and go, yo, we got these lyrics. And I'd be like, oh, word, I got the beat. Give me five minutes, I'm going to look for it. Come back five minutes, I program something. That's what this whole album reflected, basically, is me just making beats up and, you know. Right. And it, that's, just, that's just it, you know what I'm saying? Now, let's, before we, you know, get through. Pressure. Yeah, before we get into actual going through all the songs, I want to ask you guys a little bit about just how the group came together. Because, you know, some folks may not even know that no five. One, no one, no, no one truly, really. Like I, I'm not no one, but yeah. very, very few people, because we don't get a chance to actually really go over it. But very few people know the, 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 the true beginning of how Black Moon came together. Like not that how we started as a group when we started, but the person that can tell you that is Five FT. Right. So Five, why don't you explain how everything got started? Um. I moved to Bushwick in 86, and um, I went to a high school called Bushwick. That's where I met Evil D. At the time I met him, he um, 
he was DJing, he was doing music. Uh, he had a group called Unique Image with my man Ali. And uh, shout out to the Black Baron. <laughs> 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 yeah. And, um, you know, we connected. At the time, I was dancing. You know what I'm saying? So Ali was around, we was dancing. So um, they end up, they end up breaking up. So I was like, yo, you, you know, back being around him so much, I had so much records in his house. I ain't never seen so much records like this in my life. I, I'm, I'm a lover of music from growing up being around it. So we, we directly, like, directly like connected at that point, you know what I'm saying? And kept moving forward, you know, I was still dancing, he still was DJing, doing his thing. Then I went down to uh, Virginia for a minute. And um, one day I called him. And I said, yo, I'm, all, I'm coming back, um, back to New York. You know what I'm saying? So when, we, when I get back, we're going to connect. So when I got back, we connected. And during that journey, uh, you know, still dealing with music. He still was making beats. He still was DJing. He was doing wild parties, house parties. Went through the, the, the carrying the records here, carrying the records there, mad crates and all that. You know what I'm saying? So and during this process, I had met Buck in Brownsville in the center. He was dancing, you know what I'm saying? So, you know, we uh, we, we kicked it for a minute, you know what I'm saying? He, at that time that he was dancing, he also told me he wanted to deal with the music. But, you know what I'm saying, we, that's, that's what made us even connect on that level even more. So I ended up bringing him to Evil D Crib, and um, from that point forth, like, the rest is history, you know what I'm saying? You know, everything from that point forth build up to what you got on Enter the Stage, you know? Like, E, like, well, like he bought, when he bought me the E, he was like, he, when I, when I first, when I walked into the, um, I was walking out of, I was doing a show the next day uh, for a talent show, and I saw my man uh, uh, told me that he couldn't come. So I was walking out of the, the center, and I said, Dad, I don't have a partner. What am I going to do, you know? And this guy, well, this other guy, had was real tall. So when I was leaving out the center, I saw five dancing into this, to this, to this music, and I was like, I went back and I said, "Damn, he's short." And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, you know, I was like, "Yo, dad," I was like, "That's hot," you know what I'm saying? I was like, "Yo, he could, he could do it," you know what I'm saying? And he's nice too. I'm like, "Dad," so I walked back in. I said, "Yo, man, you nice, yo." I'm like, "Yo, word." He was like, "Yo, good looking, man." I was like, "Um." Word, yo, do you want to do this talent show? And he was like, yo, I'm down. And I was like, word. So I was like, yo, this stuff coming out, just these, these beats, this music you're listening to is hot. Who, where you get this from? He said, my man actually made this. I was like, what? He said, yeah, Evil, you know, Evil D. I was like, you know somebody who make this stuff? That's when he brought me over to East Crib. And then they said, yo, you know, Evil D had a, a black moon with him, and his, with him and his brother. You know what I'm saying? And then, and then we, everything right there, they said, yo, let's form Black Moon. And from right, right. there, Black Moon was born. Back. Yeah, because Black Moon was the name of your production. Black Moon was actually Beat Miner's original name. Right. Um, Mr. Walt was a fan of um, Moonlighting. <clears throat> There's a true story, too. <laughs> With Mr. Bruce Walt, Willis? Mr. Yeah. Walt was a fan <laughs> of Moonlighting. And if he was here, he would, he would punch me in the face for saying that. But he... um. The name of their detective agency was Blue Moon Detective Agency. So Walt just changed the Blue Moon to Black Moon. So Beat Miner's original name was Black Moon. Then what happened was my brother had an MC. The MC name was DEA. And DEA went beat shopping with me and my brother. Me and my brother used to go beat shopping in East New York. In this, um, it was like, yo, it was a basement filled with records. They just threw the records down there. It was wet, it was nasty. You see dead carcasses floating, <laughs> dead mice and dead rats floating. But we would be in there digging for records and we would come up looking crazy, looking like we was coal mining. So DEA was like, yo, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, y'all, y'all are beat miners, y'all are beat miners. And he made a song called Beat Miners, Walk Like That So Much. He changed Black Moon's name to Beat Miners. And that's when Buckshot said, yo, we're taking that name. <laughs> but one thing I do wanna say is, when Buck came to my house that first time, Buck walks into my house, and the first thing out of his mouth, not, yo, what's up, da-da-da, damn, you got a lot of records. 
never seen and, that many records ever. And the, another thing is, Five in school, when we was in Bushwick High School, Five was that dude. There's always one dude that went to school that was always dancing for no reason. That was 5FT. <laughs> and it was ill because I was like, yo, 5 is the nicest dance I ever seen. And then he brought Buckshot along. Like, don't don't get it twisted. These two dudes can dance. They, they may be all laid back right now, but they, they, they get theirs on that dance floor. But that was the thing then, too. It's like every yeah. crew had dancers. That was, yeah. that was our connection to hip-hop at that time on the yep. come up. You know what I'm saying? That's, that, that's how we were reflecting it at that time. And, you know, our, and in reality, we was trying to really do the dancing thing real hard. Yep. You understand? Hey, what I'm, I mean, seriously, we was trying to, like, you know, move toward that direction of, of going toward, you know, dancing, doing choreography, and really taking yep. that really seriously. And, and it's, and and it's it, ironic that Kane is here, because Scoob and Scrap, that for us, yeah, it's like to be, yeah, able to reach, yeah. to be able to reach Scoob yeah. and Scrap level was yeah. like, you're yeah. out of here. Yeah. yeah. That is Straight it. Up. That's all we want to do is wear those 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 <laughs> those outfits that they wear. <laughs> Yo, it was so wild. We would go to clubs and like music would come on and these two would just disappear and just start dancing. And it, we'd be in clubs and I'll just be out because I don't dance. So I'll just be in the background chilling and everybody be like, yo, yo, them dudes is ill. Who's that? Who's that? I'm like, yo, it's Black Moon. That's why with the music we do we, we, when we made the album. Every track that he gave us in, in our heads, and me and Five Heads, and we were still dancing. We, we had That's to be right. able to That's somehow, right. some way, yeah. melodically dance to the music. Mm -hmm. if, if, we could, if, we could, if it was grooving, then it was like, all right. So when did, how did you turn the corner and go from focusing on dancing to, to emceeing? Um, one day, we did, a, we did this show for Park. Parks the park. I think it was a Parks the park. Yeah, at yeah, the time. Yeah. yeah. And oh my gosh, I you know I don't think you. I mean that was like the first time someone had ever paid us to do a performance. I was like, this is money to do what we'd like to do. You know, I don't, this is crazy. You know, um, <laughs> I, I just I couldn't believe it. You know, I was like, wow. Out here or in yeah, Brooklyn? Yeah, in Brooklyn. Oh, yeah. In Brooklyn, it was like um, you know you do something for the park. They have a little stipend, whatever. Yeah. Take, Take back, back the, the park, park, right? That was the yeah. name of it. Okay. And they, and they and got it, us to yeah. perform. And you know what I'm saying? But, at, but, for, but for some reason, um, after that day, um, it was just something something in my chest, you know, that was like, you know, we, we kind of, we need to focus, you know, all, a little bit more on the MCN. I kind of felt like we was, we was good. But I was always studying other people and always studying. That's my thing. And I'm like, we good, but we could be better. And one of the things that, you know, we kind of got a roadblock in is we, we got, all of us got talent, but we putting too much in the bag. You know, five, me and five is dancers. He was, was, was emceeing at the time. Yeah. Oh, that's right. That's right. I was yeah. the worst MC Word ever. Up. Let it be known. He was rapping. Bro. I was the worst. <laughs> and I can admit Yo. that. I don't care what anybody says. I was, was the worst. Wow. Yeah. We called him wow. Ibu D, the master of what? The gibberish. The master of the gibberish. Master of gibberish. <laughs> yo. Right up, yo. Like, yo, yo. What in the yo, world? First yo, first of all, that let me like explain. A... You know, as a matter of fact, if you look on YouTube, this guy right here posted something, too. <laughs> he posted me rhyming, too. But you have to really look for it, though. But I was the worst MC. Unlike a lot of MCs that are whack, I knew I was whack, no. and I knew I had to quit. You know what I'm saying? No. He was like, no. yo, I'm not going to rhyme no more. I said, I ain't rhyming no more. I'm just going to DJ. I'll, <laughs> I'll yell on the mic. That's no. about it. And it was a lot of pressure. Don't get it twisted, man. We it was crawled. a lot of like, pressure. We went through a lot of rocks. We did a lot. We was, we was hustling, trying to get equipment. Someone was always get, trying to get the next a piece of equipment that was coming out. It was just working. Like, you know, we really, we really hustled. You know what I'm saying, and bustle to to even able to have a product like that. You know what I'm saying, and that's 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 crazy, man. We paid a lot of dues, man. Some was running up in working for uh, doing internship at labels. I was you, I was the know? intern. You were an intern, for, okay. I was the intern for Soul MCA Records, and at the same time, I was interning uh -huh. right after interning for Soul MCA Records. And again, it's so funny that I'm on stage with Kane tonight because I um, I. 
actually worked on the Juice soundtrack with with um right. Rich Kane was on Juice and I worked right. on that soundtrack as an intern. Yeah. That was the right. Bomb Squad's label through yeah. MCA at the time. Yes, right. yes sir. Okay. Right. Yes sir. Right. Here's the funny thing. He worked he was interning at the label. Uh, Mr. Walt finagled the promotion for the Juice joint. Like he finagled it so that we was the New York promotion reps for for the, for the juice, juice movie. Yo, they, they, they had about five, not 5,000, but it seemed Yo. like 5,000 boxes, boxes of juice, juice. stuff everywhere. everywhere. Yo, t-shirts, we had, we had juice, juice hats. Juice t-shirts, Every hats, single stickers, that they put out. Records, stickers, cassettes. Records. And, and, I, and oh, no disrespect, yeah. Juice, I'm sorry, but I'm, I, you know, I always had the hustler in me. I was hustling incense and oils and stuff like that at the time. But I also was like, wow, how could I like actually... Stack up some of this juice stuff and sell it like a record store. Right. <laughs> I, hey, I, I say it right now, yo. We was promoting the juice soundtrack and we was selling them. We was promoting them at the front door and selling everything at the back door. Come it's called the hustle. Juice. Come get your yep. juice, yo. That's how we learned how to promote on records it. today. We was on it back then. Back then, that was our first experience, even involving dealing with like having control and distributing and finagling and. And being involved with with the business side of it, and we for right. a radio show too. Yep, we ended up on a radio show and everything. What radio show? Um, we ended up doing radio with um, Lamel La Rockwell, um, WHCR, Pure Righteousness. That show, man. Wow, Hardcore right. wow. Righteousness. Yes. Wow. Shout out to Lamel, man. I haven't. Sure. Pure yo, Righteousness. Wow. Anybody hardcore can find that brother. Of course, Hardcore Righteousness. Anybody can find that brother. Tell him I said peace. Word. That's who gave wow. us our, our, okay. our yeah. very first wow. start. Word on radio. Word. And I word ended up doing word. radio at um, Hunter College. Um, I forgot oh, who yeah. went, word. though. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Word. Yeah. Hunter so this College. is all built up, though, before you guys got your break That's to right. do the single. Uh-huh. Tell right. a story about how that happened, how you met the person who ended up connecting you with Nervous. Um, so you guys performed, right? Yeah, we, had did a po- we did, our, we did a, a performance. Uh, with uh, promoting a Maria Davis, and it was uh, part of the DNA Hank Love uh, Talent Search or something, some showcase they was having, and um, we was actually about to walk out the door because it seemed like they wasn't gonna put us on stage. It's like the time was running now, so we put on our cold hoodies, our jump book bag, knapsacks, and was getting ready to walk out the door. But Maria stopped us and said, "Just give me five minutes," and. Um, she let us get on and we did our thing, you know what I'm saying? And um, Chuck Chill Out was in the crowd. And um, he had approached us on our way outside and told us that, you know, uh, you know, I'm feeling y'all, y'all doing their thing, y'all doing, you know, y'all did your thing. We got a situation, give me a call, you know what I'm saying? So he gave his number to Buck. Then uh, Buck ended up calling him, you know, they connect, talk, whatever. We end up meeting up with him, going to Nervous. You know, got nervous, brought us in with Michael Weiss, in front of Michael Weiss. We performed. We performed no in demo. the spot. I saw, I was out demo, you know what I'm saying? No demo. No, no demo. We it got no, you know, no we, demo. We had a demo made, but that particular meeting wasn't, it had nothing to do with a demo. It had all to do with performance. performance. We got like, on, we actually got on because we performed, because of yeah. our performance. We gave out, like, you know, I gave the demo, like, I sent the demo out to everybody, and you got the rejection letter of, the, yo, this is hot, but it's not what we're looking for. And it's funny, because I still got the rejection letters from, like, Chemistry Records, Warner Brothers. The only only two labels I did not give the record to was Profile and Def Jam, and I'm going to tell you why. Profile, Funkmaster Flex was the a and and I didn't want him to think that I was using our friendship to get a record deal. And at Def Jam, Bob Beto was the an A&R. And the same thing, I didn't want him to think I was using his friendship to get a deal. Now, the funny thing is, um, Search was at Wild Pitch. And, you know, I didn't give Wild Pitch it either. And when the record came out, Stu Fine and Search was like, yo, what the, what the fuck? You ain't gonna give this to us? What's wrong with you? And like it's everybody who everybody who I didn't give the demo to was mad at me, and anybody right. who right. fronted on the demo was mad at themselves. <laughs> yeah, we yep yep. And he said we walked in and he said, sitting right right from that point of view, you guys are at. 
and I'm Michael Weiss, and I'm sitting here like this. And he said, um, let me see what you got. Right. And five, I said, I looked at five, and we looked at each other. <laughs> yeah. I looked at eight, and I said, yo, y'all ready? This is the last <laughs> and he, shot. And, he, and I said, this yep. is, is either, it's, either it's going to go now, or it's never, never going to go. go. <laughs> and, we said, let's, and we said, let's do it. Bomb, and we did our thing, and we did it, and we routine it in, and, uh, and then after that, it was like, bomb, what you think? And he was like, I love it. I've never seen all that. I'm, I'm not, we walked out of there like this. <laughs> I don't believe it. That's that not, yo, no, we, like we did it. Like, we, we, you know, all, all the blood, sweat, and tears, even on a personal level, the blood, sweat, and tears, yeah. you know what I'm saying, struggling. You know, trying to trying to make things happen, or, or dealing with being in 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 the street and not be caught up in the, in the, in the drama, or be a statistic, or not being able to achieve anything. You know what I'm saying? And that's that's why that 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 album means a lot to me because I know the work prior to us, the actualization of that CD, of the things that we had to go through, or the things that we sacrificed ourselves to go through to make that happen. Yeah. You know, I was going to go through each track in the sequence of the CD, but since this is the single that set it off, I think we should maybe start with that, if that's cool. Who got the props? Yeah. So let's play a little piece of that. Who got the props from Black Moon? All right. Little applause, please. Thank you. Now, that's the joint that set it off for you. Now, do you want to do a little demonstration? Just production tip here. All right, so production-wise, um, this record was actually oh, produced man. by myself. What happened was, first of all, let me explain something. This record, when we shot the demo, this record was not a part of our demo. Nope. What happened was, we had a record called Feminine Hood. Is that right? Yep. Feminine Hood. And it was basically like a gangster bitch type record. <laughs> right? And who came up with that title? I ain't gonna tell y'all who. But what happened was, um, I think we was leaving the label or something and we bumped into Q tip, I think we bumped into. And it was like, yo, what's up? He's like, yo, I just I just left the studio and Patchy got this record called Gangsta Bitch. And we looked at it, we I think I looked at Buck like, oh shit. That's our idea. So what happened was I, I had made this beat and Buck, one thing, let me tell y'all something about Buck, right? This dude fucking keeps everything. This dude goes in, digs up the cassette. Yo, this is the beat I want to rhyme to right here. And it was um, the Who Got, you know, the Who Got the Props Joy. And it's like, we ended up throwing, how long it took to throw that together? Like about a day or something? Like about a, I think about a day, cause yeah. cause we was said they was told us to come up with some, and he he had yeah, to we do that at Shlomo's. Well, yeah, we yeah, what happened? We, right, we did right. it at Shlomo's, the studio. But what, what was more crazy though, when we wrote the record, when he gave us the beat, I was so happy. We wrote the record at Chuck Chilla's house. Word of mother and in the we, BX and the BX, and we were sitting at Chuck Chilla had like a one half of a bedroom or something because it was yeah. it was just real crazy how to describe it was because we was real tucked in. Man, me and five was on the floor, and Chuck Chilla out is in the kitchen cooking burgers, and he's like, "Y'all want some burgers?" And we like, "Nah, we good, we all right." True. And he's story. like, "Y'all done yet?" And we like, "Nah, we will be done in a few minutes." And I'm like, "Damn," you know what I'm saying? I'm sitting here, and next thing you know, we came in with the lyrics. And we got we got it. We wrote this joint at okay. Chuck Chilla's house. Yo. You recorded it at Such a Sound in yeah. Brooklyn studio. It's no longer here now. Yeah, right? Such a yeah, Sound such a studio. Sound studio. Now, and I'm gonna tell y'all something Yo. about this record that nobody knows. First of all, they didn't have a setup for the turntables, so I did the cuts sitting on the floor. The That's number one. Number two. Me and the engineer Slow Mo got into a big argument every time because I, I wanted the record to sound one way. He was trying to take over my record, so he just said, just like this, Oh, you think you know everything? Mix the record yourself. So that was the first record I ever mixed myself in the studio. Wow. And I did, the, I did the mixing, I set all the levels. You know, that was my first engineering job in a professional studio. And you have the results on the album right now. Okay. Now this is the original sample. 
what I did was the first part of that, I, I repeated that three times. Then the last part came in at the end. And that was the beat. Who got the props? The drums to that beat is... Um, I didn't bring those records. <laughs> oh, no, it's all cool. Sport, Slow Down by... Um, well, it's Cool in the Gang. Well, I forgot what they called that record, though. It wasn't Cool in the Gang at the time. It was Lightning Rod, right? Lightning Rod. The, the Hustlers Convention. The Hustlers Convention. Right. And um, skull snaps right. put together. Put together, right? Back then we wasn't back then we wasn't um, chopping samples. Everything was straight sample. So that's sport. The drums is sport, and um, 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 skull snaps. Skull snaps put together. Just just synced up. So yeah, that they lined up. up. Yeah. yeah. The bass part of the drums is sport. The part that you hear is skull snaps. Okay. And the glitter, I still forgot where I got that from. <laughs> but I know, I know it's a Blue Note record. Okay. okay. But other than that, that's it. And the Come On is Wild Style. Right, right. You know what I'm saying? Now, it took a minute for this record to take off, or how long did it take for it once it got out on the street? Who, who, who broke this record in New York? Yo, I may be wrong, but the first time I heard the record played, Kick Capri played it. Really? Okay. The Kick Capri was on BLS. Right. And Kick Capri was. Yeah. I was, yo, I, 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 I'm going to run down how I heard it, too. I was walking to the I was walking to the corner store, to the bodega, and Kick Capri was on. Everybody was, you know, they, you, back then, everybody had their radio out, and everybody was listening to Kick Capri, and he just went straight into it. Boom, boom, da -da 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 -da. and I was like, yo, that's my record. <laughs> no, it's not. You know what I'm saying? But it's like Kick Capri played the instrumental. He talked over it. Then he let the vocals play. Then right after that, that was um, Friday night. Saturday night, the Awesome 2 bl um, blasted off on it. So the Awesome 2 was second. Yep. And then, like, you had the Dirty Dozen, DNA, Hank Love, the whole lineup on um, WNWK. Every show played it. Yep. Then after that, like, Red Alert got on to so it. Then Red Alert got on. And okay. it just took off from there. But that was New York-wise. That's New York, yeah. It took a minute to spread from New York across to the rest of the world. But what it took like a year, right? Almost a little something, a little, a little uh, somewhere around that. Now I did uh, probably a few months, but we was <clears throat> doing like 360 Black right. Festival tournament. I mean, we was doing, we was running around like, that's like, I mean, like we yeah. was running around it's like working wild. This, just, I mean, we was working yeah. and pushing it back then. Tas our, little you know. Tasmanian Devil, I mean, we was right. going everywhere. We was in two spots. At the same time. Yeah. <laughs> wow. That's crazy to think of because now we're in an age where it's like you get an MP3, it's over. You get 30 MP3s listed on a blog in a day, and then everybody forgot about them the next day. Yeah. You got a record here that you had to work for several months to try to, like, break nationally, not just through New York. Yeah. And, you know, it well, still that's, has that's that sort a blessing. of... It was, it was a blessing how everything, you know, came about on our first time, you know what I'm saying? Like, nobody was really schooling us, you know what I'm saying? Nobody was really there to direct and say, nah, you shouldn't do that, you know what I'm saying? From the groundwork of being in the street and, and Buck uh, working uh, uh, as an intern with that knowledge information and the knowledge we already had from, from the research about this dealing life period, you know what I'm saying? We was able to take that information and that energy and, and, and come up with that product. Yeah. Everything was on our own. We went our first show. We had to go there and get bread from the promoter. We didn't know what that was, you know what I'm saying? Be, you know, at that time, like, we had to take that responsibility. I often tell my man Boogie when we first did the first, the first session, Michael Weiss, uh, we no longer was working with Chuck Chillout when, right. when we first did the album. When we got the call to do the album, Chuck Chillout, was already, uh, uh, you know, fired or whatever the term you want to use or not. <laughs> Let's we, just we, say he left. <laughs> we, wasn't, we wasn't working with Chuck, whatever, at that point. And um, Michael Weiss had gave me, like, you know, so, uh, like like maybe like $10,000 in cash, you know. Oh, yeah, and that's and right. I was like, right. I'm like, what, what's going on here? Like, what, what do you do? I was scared. I went to the studio. You know, you guy asked me, how are you going to you know, pay for it? I pull out all this money. I'm like, money. Yo. I'm, like, yeah, well, I'm like, am I doing the right thing? Ten like, stacks. Oh, God, this, the pressure was just bananas, you know what I'm right. saying? And how old are you guys at this point, too? We were young. We were 18, 17, 18. 
I'm 17, old. 18. Word is born. I'm old. I was 21. I'm old. <laughs> 18, yeah. 17, 20, like that. So yeah, we was the pressure. The pressure was on us when we when we uh, when we did that album. Because Michael's okay. So Michael said after the single started taking off, guys do a, do an entire album. Yeah. yeah. After right. the album, after the single took off, he said, um, later for doing the second single, just He's going to do, do an album. Okay. And right. at that point, that's what <laughs> that was a blessing. We wrote who got the props for like a whole year. Yeah. Yeah. Single. And, and that's crazy crazy to think you, about you, you, you was able to do that back then yeah. because it was a whole different time. Like records lived. You know what I'm saying? Like look at look at when look at when um um Egg Beef President came out. That record lived for like two it years. Hard. Yeah. It was breathing. And it was Bring hard. It, it was hard. That's that's the reason why when we it, when we called it into the stage, um we well, well we called it into the stage because we knew at that time, the minute we got the call to do this album. We was gonna go through some tough stages, yeah. and and we knew, like Five said to you, it wasn't easy because we were doing this by ourselves, um, and it was it was really a tough time. So we called it into the stage because we was prepared to enter the first stages of what we were about to go through because we knew it was a long run. Right. Well, yeah. let's let's actually start going through a couple of these songs here. We're gonna start with Powerful Impact, first track off Into the Stage. All right. So I'm going to tell you on the production side about that record. Basically, everybody was looking for the rare beats. They was looking for this. They was looking for that. I was like, look, you know what? I'm a, I'm a beat man. I'm always looking for that rare beat. But this time around, I'm going to sample all hip-hop records. The the beat is um, uh, Dundada by Kenny Dope. That was on Big Beat. That was like a party record. The bass line is just to get a rep, Gangstar, cut in half. The explosion is the end of I Ain't No Joke. And of course, the, um, the, the scratches is scenario. You know what I'm so saying? That's entirely produced off of other hip -hop people's hip-hop yeah. records. All hip-hop records. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because I was like, yo, you know what? I'm going to catch everybody out there. And the funny thing was, the only person that was able to identify his record was Kenny Dope. Because when Premier heard the record, he was like, yo, that's crazy. What's that? I'm like, that's your record. <laughs> <laughs> he was a scientist with everything. I remember he used to make beats off a double tape deck, cassette um, jump off. I used to be bugging, like, how you making beats off that? Yeah, yeah. Word. Lyric wise, I just we just just I just felt like a powerful impact. I just he gave it had a beat and I just felt like this is the introduction to the world. So this is just yo, I was I was I listen to even the stuff now, you know, I'm like, that was crazy. Yeah, cause I, cause yeah. I, cause I you know, I, That's I the blessing, because we was just vibing out. Like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Crazy. Like hitting it and, and, and writing to to production like that is you know, just expressing how we felt. You know what I'm saying? There's no certain criteria like we do, you know, now now that we know more about how things go. You know what I'm saying? Like Back Buckshot then, Shorty go. was really Buckshot Shorty. Shorty. Yeah. yeah. Word up. Yeah. Unshadowed, like, I, you know, uh, we all grow at some point in time. I say we elevate from Buckshot Shorty to Buckshot, but, yeah, Buckshot Shorty is, was, was, was fighting a fair one with the devil and... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all of that. Buckshot Shorty is, yeah. Gotta hear that, you know what I mean? And, and yet... You know, if you look at the album, I'm not looking up. Anybody who got it, I'm not looking up for because I never really like the pop, the care. I don't. I'm not a, a fame person. Yeah. All right, let's let's go on to the next track, which is entitled. I won't say the title. You said. <laughs> yeah. All right. Niggas talk shit. <laughs> From Black Moons, crazy. into the stage. <laughs> All right. Production-wise. Sounds pretty good, huh? <laughs> I cannot remember. I think that's a Miles Davis record I said, but I cannot remember. The horn or the bass line? The bass line. I love how he had it filtered, yeah. though. It's good crazy God. filter, yeah. yeah. I always um, love how he used to filter the, the non yeah. Um, The drums are Ike, the, Ike and Tina Turner drums. Yeah. Same drums they have in Spread Love. Uh, then -da. Stanley Turn Turnstein. Stanley Turnstein. Yes. Yeah. I can't. I'm sorry. I said it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. 
A lot of the horns on the album is the same album. That same album. Really? Yeah. Which Stanley Tarantino album? Um, <laughs> the one that has a dinner, dinner, dinner. He knows records. Oh, that that's way. why. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want a way to name it. You know, yo, I don't. You know, you know what it is? Like, I, I, I don't remember the album name. Like, Walt was he probably would know, but it's Walt that, here. Walt's not here. All right, Mr. Walt. Walt, Walt definitely would definitely. What corner of Walt? Later. He's making Walt, a beat. <laughs> Walt's the older, older brother. Yeah. I, I'm, oh, let me put y'all up on something. Also, when I was making this album, I was not digging for records the way that I dig for records now. I was digging for records in my brother's collection. What we would do is my brother would go to work, me, Buck, and Five would run into his apartment, do what we going to do, make beats, do what we going to do, and then fix everything back and go sit on the steps. So when every my brother time. walks in, every he sees time. us sitting on the steps. Every so time. every record I sampled on this at the time, I stole from my brother's collection. Oh, man. Now, can you actually yeah, you can know, you Walt. explain also what Walt's job was at the time, too, because that was really important in terms of, you know, you guys knowing people in the business. I mean, people must be wondering, oh, you know Q-Tip? You knew yeah. Funkmaster Flex? You knew all these people before you even got a record out. You know, how did you, how did you guys know some of these folks, especially out in Queens? Well, what happened was my brother, Mr. Walt, worked at the music factory in Jamaica, Queens. Now, the music factory in Jamaica, Queens is very important because everybody in hip hop somehow ended up at that store, especially Queens, um, Queens hip hop artists. My brother sold Jam Master Jay, God rest of dead, his turntables. He sold LL his radio. He sold um, Large Professor his first breakbeat he ever bought. Um, my brother sold records to Dayla, to Public Enemy. As a matter of fact, he sold records to Q-Tip, Fife, and all of them. Q-Tip, um, Q-Tip liked my brother so much, he made a record called The What. And on that record, he said, what's the music factory without Mr. Walt? And that's how my brother got his name, Mr. Walt. My brother, my brother was, you know, was so influential at the time when it came to music. Like Ed Lover like used to hang out in the store with him. Flavor like my brother would come home every day with pictures with mad, different artists. I was about to say, I remember that? I was about to say, he, to say he the used mad to be hating. I used yeah. to be so mad. He never wanted to take us to yep. the party. Yeah, that was, that was he got the day. pictures with salt and pepper, was, yeah. pop and slick Rick. Yo, yo, yo you know what I just remembered? Like, yo, you yo, already know. Yo, hold up. You know what I just remembered? Did y'all y'all worked with us when we did that that in store with Ice T? Nah, nah we, we, we yo, didn't come with you. Here's a funny story. My brother would do these in stores. It was an in-store with Ice T and Big Daddy Kane, come to think of it. And wow. the thing about it was the in like, I was, at the time, I was mad skinny. My brother was like, your security. <laughs> and it was like, yo, like, but that's what my brother would do. My brother would have all these artists come through to his store, and he knew everybody. Me and Five used to just have to look at the pictures. I swear, Yo, we'd be like, "Oh, oh you gonna pay for that?" <laughs> you know, that, you was you was there. With I ain't them, gonna, man. That was part of the drive too, to um push yeah. and, and, and and be able to be a part of this culture, man. Things like that, like where we can't go, we dying to get in here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what up? All right, let's 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 <laughs> move on. We already heard. We got the props. We'll skip. You know, it's funny because I had I used to listen to this record on vinyl, and then when, later when I heard the CD, I was like, "Whoa, they have all the extra tracks on here." So, what is like in your mind the definitive version of the album? Is it the one with the CD that most people know now, with all the the bonus tracks? Is it the vinyl version? You know, it's the it's the um it's funny because the version I have is the CD version on vinyl. So, oh, you know. You're special, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, my, like, right. the, like you know, the, the way we put the CD together and everything. It's actually, believe it or not, my real version is the cassette. The cassette, because back then the cassette was very important. And we, me and Mr. Walt, um, Buck, I'm um, five, Drew Ha, sat down and was like, look, we're going to balance out both sides to make sure the sides are equal so that there's no dead air at the end of one side so that the other side can get more. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's 
the whole thing. The, the cassette version is the one that we took the time out to do. Okay, all right. Well, this was a B-side. It's on the CD and the cassette version. It was also for those who had the vinyls, a B-side. So we're going to hear Act Like You Want It. Now, the funny thing about Act Like You Want It, real, real quick, is that record was made in the beginning. That record was made before a lot of... Okay. That was one of the first records we did after um, Who Got the Props, right? Exactly. That, that was the actual, was... our first time in an actual full throttle studio. I mean, a real actual booth set up with the mic came. No, that was crazy. And that was anything that was almost pretty much set up to be the second single, if there was going to be a second single. But we, had, we went to doing uh, the album, and we said, you know what, well, that's going to be on the reverse side, the B side of who got the props. Right. You know what I'm saying? But the reason why that record is special, because that was the first time that, before that record, I didn't know what freestyling was. You know what I'm saying? I didn't know how MCs had the ability to rhyme uh without putting the pen to the paper. I didn't know, understand that concept at all. So he had this beat, he had to act like he wanted to beat, and me and Five was in the, in the, in the hotel in um, uh, and, uh, San Francisco, wow. and um, he played the beat. And after freestyling with Nas and Coogee Rap and the youngsters and a few wow. other MCs in this one room for hours, 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 and I'm freestyling doing these records off of of, of the end of the stage and other stuff. And I ran out of lyrics, right? <laughs> and I'm so mad that at that point, I tried to freestyle a little bit and I couldn't do it. So I just let the rest of them do it. I got to the room, I played the beat and I was like, later for this. And I just kept doing it. And I swear to God, it came out like, CD, see me, because does anybody want to be BD? And I was like, oh, I ran, I woke five up. I said, five, I knew, I got it, I got it. And from that point, I knew how to freestyle. And, and, and act like you want to always remember me yeah. about that. that yeah. the genesis cool. of, 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 of evolving into being a better MC. All right. We're going to... Oh. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna yeah, to keep it moving to the yeah. next one, actually. One, two, three, four, five. All right. Here's a good one. Buck them down. Shorty was really mad at the industry. Yeah. I said Shorty was mad at the industry. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of... Venom in your... Yeah, no, he ain't like that. He ain't buckshot short. What? He ain't like to make the industry. All right, Damn. he's going to just show us a little demonstration of where this came from. For those I, who may not know. First of all, let me explain something. I didn't know how to really work in a studio. Like, I didn't know how to mix a record or nothing like that. I just knew I wanted to make records that was loud. Like, me and Mr. Walt, we was on some, yo... Turn it up, it got to be loud. That was our whole thing. And, you know, when you're mixing a record, you mix it in the small NS10 speakers. We was like, no, fuck that. Put them in the big speakers, turn it up loud. And every session, if we blew the fuses, we knew it was hot. <laughs> and it got to a point, we was in Calliope Studios. Before I would go to the studio, I would buy a box of fuses. And... Go in, put the fuses on top of the console, and go, let's rock. And it's like everything we played, blue speakers. That's word of the um, This right here, what I'm about to play, is the original sample for um, Buck 'em Down. It's called Wind Parade by Donald Bird. And I'm going to show y'all something also after I play the part I sampled. Did you, you know, hear how the bass is so crazy? This is probably like my favorite example from this album of the, the bass just mm. filtered, the sample filtered so crazy heavy. Because when it starts, that track starts, it's like, you know, it's like, you know. Um, I mean, it's everything. Yeah. Yeah, the everything filtered. <clears throat> yeah, everything's super filtered. And, you know, just to, like, that's hear that, where it comes from is this. That's that nine. First of all, that's another thing I have to explain to y'all. In the studio, we used the SB-1200 and the 950. But in my house, I was doing all the filters and everything on a Kai 612, which is the 
the process, the, the first um, sampler before the um, 900 and 950 series. And the filter on that is, and is so incredible. You know, it's and the it's, old stuff that got the good filters. Yeah, it's like, forget about it. Like, the, the filters was just berserk. But, you know, once again, put the record together. Um, Buckshot comes in, Five comes in. And Buckshot comes up, yo, the, the corpse is going to be buck him down. So it was like, all right, buck him down, buck him down, buck him down, buck him down. Like, cats going back and forth, you know. Now that was more better, with me and Drew, how I always talk about the, the fun that we had in the studio doing uh, each chorus. Because in the chorus, there would always be somebody that had to get kicked out of the room. You know what I'm saying? Because we would, it would always, like, we can hear it, it'd be like, buck him down, buck him down, buck him down, buck him down, buck him down. And they'd be like, yo, who is off? Who is, buck him down, buck him down. And be like, oh. wait a minute. Do me a favor, everybody say it again. It's yeah. you. Yeah. Come on out of the booth for a second. Let me yeah. see everybody do it again. There we go. If you was fucking <laughs> up, you got kicked out. That, that happened on a lot That's of how we get, That's how it went yeah. down. Oh, man. My oh, thing was this. Crazy. If you came to the studio, you came to work. So you was if you came inside that room, you was going to be put to work. And it was like, all right, oh, you're here today? You, you, you're hanging out? No, you're not. You're, you're doing the chorus. The chorus. Word up. You're on the like, chorus. And it's funny because there's people who did backgrounds on End of the Stage who I cannot, have not seen since we did the record, but their voice is on the record. Sounds like all of Brooklyn is doing backgrounds <laughs> on this trip. We had girls that came to the studio. They, they're on the record, and I don't know what was going on. This track, this next one, is a, another good example of that. Blacksmith and Wesson. <laughs> oh, man. Um, he was just getting, f I mean, the beast was just getting. Yo, when I tell you, like, it was a, like a blessing, like, like, it was the flow. We was just flowing. We would come to the studio every day to have an agenda to get something done. It was like no real format. You know what I'm saying? Yo, that's that that vibe that they bought right there was was a real powerful business. And E E was just like I said, the beast. It was like at that time, it was like every day they would bring a beat. It was just like another murderer, what? like another, because it was I did. There was never times when it was like every beat that they gave us we used for like that. It wasn't a go through a shuffle of beats. That that didn't that wasn't. Nah, nah, that it wasn't, wasn't none of that. We went in the studio. E made the beat right there. Or had the idea, you know what I'm saying? And he, it, it, it came through. We clicked with it. Like that's that's how he was working. The yeah. funny thing about that record is, um, that's Amar Jamal misdemeanor, yeah. and um, I really wanted to sample the the Forster Silver's joint, but there was no clear part. So one of the things that I got into beat shopping is buying every version of a record that I like. Like, for instance, uh, the record uh, Aquarius, I have like a hundred different versions of Aquarius because I like that record. And the thing about it is when you buy different versions, you hear different things. And um, I sampled the record, and it's funny because Premier sampled the record also. So I was like, damn, I don't want to compete with this dude, but I got to make mine kind of a little bit more... You know, so I got the Lonnie Liston Drive drums, which is the same drums from Can I Kick It? And just looped that up and just chopped, sat there and chopped up the different violin parts. And then the last thing I added to it was the, um, was that Ninja Man? I think Ninja Man. And the funny thing was, I seen the Ninja Man joint on a, um, on a, um, it, on a, um, v, uh, VCR tape. It was one of the um, Jamaican jams. And what happened was he said that, and I don't know, maybe the, the plug came out. It just said, anything, test my me cleaning from me gun. And you just heard a mad hum. And I was like, yo, I need to sample that. DJ Shadow must have been thinking the same thing because I bought a Shadow record. On this Shadow record was the same thing. So I just took it straight off of his record. So and thanks, that and, and 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 and, and evil. I mean, and um, that record also introduced Smith and Wesson to the world. Um, Smith and Wesson uh, was like, you know, I react the way I react because I love them so much. And they they were um, 
uh, childhood, you know, friends of mine. They went to school with my sister. And um, thanks to my sister, my sister actually brought me and 5FT to do a show uh, with her at the Apollo. She was performing at the Apollo with Steel. Word. Steel from Smith and Wesson Bless actually was an MC before we, you know, what I'm saying. Word. Uh, this is, they had a group. It was called Steel and the Most Clan. And um, I was a I was a fan of his when my sister brought his tape home, and they we, we did a demo. We did a show with him, and after that show, I always was like, yo, I I was still dancing. So, just on some real stuff, still is the one who kind of coached me. To be a better MC, still was the one that really put the mic in my hand. Before that, I used to mess with it, and, and, uh, you know what I mean? Should a little bit, but still was the one that really. I used to watch, still used to come to my house and sit on a chair and rhyme for hours without, for no reason. I used to sit there and go like this, and be like, "This dude is so nice. I could just keep doing this all day." And he, I just stayed around him. So when we did the album, I said, "Y'all gotta be on this album." The minute I get a record deal, I promise you, man, I'm gonna get me a record deal, and y'all gonna get on the album, and that's why. The funny thing, is, I mean, to cut you off. Uh, the funny thing was, Buckshot came to my house, and he was just like, "Yo, E, it's this dude named MC Steel. MC Steel, this, and MC Steel that." I was like, "Yo, my man." That's cool, but let's do our stuff first. Then you could bring MC Steel and the Click and the Clan, and and it's ill because when I met Steel, that's when I was like, "Oh, I see what you're talking about." And Steel had his homeboy who never said a word. He would just stand there and look at everybody like they crazy. His tech homeboy, nev- his tech homeboy nev- Tech. Nev- and I was surprised nev- when nev- I first heard nev- Tech nev- rhyme because I didn't think he could speak. He was so quiet, yo. This dude, Tech would just be in the background just on some... Not saying nothing. Suck. Not saying a he word. He would not say a word. Everything. You'd be like, don't yo, what look, up, and, Tech? And He'd be don't like, look mm. mean and nothing like that, but just be like... That's it. <laughs> All right, let's go on to our next track. This is Five's solo track, mm. Sun Get Wreck. Five, what do you want to say about this this track? Yeah, that track was um, the original track that we that we had for that was the same beat that Little Kim used for No Time. That was the original beat that we had. Okay. But we couldn't get the sample clearance at that time, so that's why we ended up using this one. And um, that shit was fire. That was fire. Straight like that. That was fire, man. I, I'll be honest, though. I like this version better than the first version because this version is more, at the time, was more Black Moon to me, you know? Yeah. It's like, you know, the first version I used the um, the uh, Soul Sister joint. The doo 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 and then I had some drums looped up. To, I had the Chiba Chiba drums looped up to it. Yeah. And it just sounded crazy to me. I was like, <laughs> this is not a go. It doesn't sound right. And it's funny because that version ended up coming out anyway. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Um, that, well, that's, you know, that's a whole different story. Oh, okay. You know? On that other record. Yeah. No, no. I say the, Digging in the Vaults. You yeah, know? yeah. Digging in the Vaults was a bunch of, bunch of stuff that didn't make it into the stage, and it was a bunch of practice sessions and four-track sessions, and, you know, the remix is thrown onto a CD and given to the people, yeah. you know, and um, that, I was, I was angry at that album, but you know what, people wanted it, so they got it, you know what I'm saying, so, hey. Yeah, this song actually has one, one of my favorite lyrics on this album, too, which is, when you say, blew out his brains, left them on the <laughs> dinner table. <laughs> Went home, puffed the herb, and watched the little cable. <laughs> Yo, that was crazy. I I listen to that to this day, and I still say to my like, I listen to that to this day, <laughs> and um, yo, we was I was in the zone back then. I can be honest with you, I I don't even know where that even came from. But like I said, like, you know. <laughs> We was just expressing ourselves how we felt, how we probably more or less, how things were right. actually certain things to an extent was in the element of where we was, you know, coming up and becoming. You know what I'm saying? You know, those are not like wild out situations or scenarios that wasn't actually happening. Those are things that was actually happening, you know what I'm saying, at that time. So. Yeah. All right, we're going to go on to make money. 
That record was produced. That's one of the beats that I wish I made. That was Walt produced by that. Mr. Walt. Okay. Yeah. And Mr. Walt, like, when he played that for me, I was like, yo, this is crazy. He was like, yo, that's for y'all. You know what I'm saying? It was like, yo, I was like, yo, you know, okay, I hope when Buck and them hear it, they like it. And as soon as they heard it, it was like, you know what I'm saying? They just went and did what they had to do. Monster, monster. I mean, it was like saying, you know, the music, like I said, the best way for me to describe what was going on at the time lyrically that is that we're extremists. And if we were told to go in and take out, take out the enemy, we're going to take them out. If we were told to let it be known how we're going to take it down, then we're going to let it be known in the most extreme way. Because we extreme. We was going full we throttle. Was full we was going full throttle with this project. So it was like no hose bar. So we, we gave it like more than 110%, you know what I'm saying, to make sure that we give quality music, quality lyrics, and people, you know, a, a real good quality album at that time of like, you know, when when you had Kane at that time, L. Ra, you know, you had conglomerate heavy hitters that was already doing the damn thing, you know what I'm saying? We was like, yo, we gotta come hard so we could be able to compete or keep up or be involved. You know, that's the determination and energy that we, we, we put it that was yeah. put on us yeah. when we was putting this album together. Yeah. And it was pressure, don't get it twisted. It was a lot of it was a lot of pressure. A lot of pressure. You know, the, the because like I said, the, the the pressure came from the fact that it was like every single time E or Walt, you know, a beat miners brought a beat to the table, it was fire. You know, for for, for you know, for that zone and that moment and that vibe we was in it matched the criteria, it matched the zone, it was fire. Mm -hmm. So that's that's a lot of pressure on a person to, you know, not saying you looking for the track the next day that's gonna be like, ah, oh, it's okay, and you gonna come with another one that'll give me a day to get my lyrics together or right. whatever. Every day, every time mm -hmm. they came with a track, it was fire, so it was like, damn. Right. You know, and that pressure of going, okay, you know, this one gotta be as good as the last one, and you know, so it, it was a lot of pressure. Yeah. Okay, let's go on to Slave. Yo, yo. This is another one of those tracks that was that was like crazy even at this point when we did do this song of just like when, you know, Buck was taking his flows to the whole other levels every time, every time. And, and, and Ian Walk, they was coming with that fire every time. Those, you know, that that pressure and that fire right there is what helped create good songs like this, you know what I'm saying? I mean, that's all I can say, like he just said. It, yeah. I, I try to not to over-concentrate on it like that, but, you know, if we talking about real stuff and we being real, you know what I'm saying? Like this this is like a real conversation we having. And just to be real, like those flows and like like I, it was, I said trapped. And it's funny that I just said something about the pressure before that. Mm -hmm. But I said trap, you know, trapped in the mind of a trap with a nigga like me, you know. I'm getting the uh I'm get that was my those I didn't there was nothing conventional for me to go rhyme with, you know, wise. So I didn't follow people. I didn't, there were no rhyme schools. Yeah. There was nothing. It was pure go off of your heart and what you think. So a lot of that stuff was just me taking a chance, literally, and going, I don't know how they're going to react to this. You know, the average person that get on the mic be like, you know, well, this door don't open until after dark. And, then, and here I am going, I'm getting the, ah, uh, I'm getting the, ah. Uh. Like, I'm just, you know, I'm just, exp so a lot of it was just simply, the pressure to, and be you, Buck, and just Black Moon it is no we we. Mm -hmm. It was no pre you know? Yeah, it really is just spirited being you and taking the chance. Yep, right. yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we're gonna go into I got you open, right? That, that was yeah. That right there, once again, Mr. Wall at work. Mr. Wall, yo, Mr. he Wall. put that together. I, I don't know. I think I think I came up with the scratch or, or did you come up with it with the chorus? I, about the chorus, I got you open. I yeah. didn't mean the words, yeah, but the scratch. Yeah, you know, the scratch. Okay, I came up with the scratch. I would have come up with the scratch, but my hand doesn't work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, 
I feel like people, uh, the you know, everybody knows the remix, but the people who know the know that this and, is. And I gotta think, I definitely, he, my man, he should be on. He's coming up. I, I definitely got to big up one person. He's not in Black Moon. He's not a part of Black Moon, but he might as well be. I probably I've seen him in every video. He's a face that's in every video, did a, every show, a thousand. His name is Mighty Real. Um, um, he's from Coney Island, because I grew up in Coney Island. His name is Mighty Real. And, you know, I'm with Mighty, you know, every every day, every, every day. And um, Mighty was with us through this whole album. And I big up Mighty because he was a big part of the pressure. Mighty has a lot to do with a lot of those flows and stuff like that. Because Mighty, each night I'd be at my house and me and him would sit down. He would say, yo, what you going to come up with next? What type of flow you going to do on this one? And I'd be like, I don't know, I gotta. Do it. So he would every night in different times, you know, it would be a flow thing with Mighty. So when I got you open, the original, that's why I was talking on it. I go from flow to flow. Then just be like, yo, how'd you do that? It just be like, yo, all that. Never forget that I'm the. I was like, all right, I got you. Even the way this com you come in on this record is kind of tricky because you're trying to, as a listener, you're hearing for where the beat starts, <laughs> and you come in, kind of, kind of. You're, a little You're off. not quite sure where <laughs> the loop starts. Mm -hmm. you yeah. co it, it comes around later where you can figure it out. Had but a lot of it's fun. tricky. Had a lot of fun doing it. Had a lot of fun. Like I said, just had a lot of fun. Just playing, playing around, around with, with stuff. Playing around. Just with experimenting, stuff. man. <laughs> Whoa. Mm -hmm. All right. Next. This is one of several songs from that era entitled "Shit Is Real," but wow, one of the best. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That record right there, um, I was experimenting. I was in a studio, me and um, Swift, who was engineering at the time. Uh, they, had this, um, they had this piece of outboard gear called the Ultra Harmonizer. Now, the Ultra Harmonizer is what, what today they would call it, um, they would call it, uh, what is, what's that T-Pain sh shit? Auto-Tune. That was yesterday's auto tune. People use that to tune their vocals. I think I'll be sure I'll probably lived with one, but you know. Um, what it is is I was in the studio with, with Swift and I sampled something and he meant to send it through the compressor and he sent it through the ultra harmonizer and the pitch changed, but it was still going the same speed. So I was like, yo, on the real? Maybe I could tune the samples to sound more, music. it could match more musically. So this record is what that is. Basically, the drums is a Dennis Coffey record, Whole Lot of Love. The horn is a song called My Love Song to Catherine, which is John Clemmer. The, um, the, uh, the, the keys is Riding High Faso. And what it is is um, I tuned everything to the bass line, the California Soul, and it just worked. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, yo, like to me, as a producer, that was like experimenting to the extreme back then. You know what I'm saying? It yeah. was, you know, and cats heard that, and it was funny because some cats heard it, and it was like, yo, what you sampled? And I'm like, uh, records in front of your face. Because all those records are common records. You know, it's not like a record that you have to dig for. And, you know, you got the results right there. Yeah. Now, I want to ask one specific thing about this song before we go to the next one. There's a, there's a part in the, towards the end of the record where there's this crazy drama going on in the background. It's like, you know, part of the mood of the whole out, of yeah. the song and what you guys are talking about. Yeah. Like, what's going on there in the background with all this drama and everything? Is it, is it just, like, something you guys decided you wanted to do, like... That was just real stuff. <laughs> that was just real stuff. What five, it was. Five, yeah. He was like, he was like, yo, we need something. We need y'all to put something on the end <laughs> of this record. So we was mad twisted, mad roasted. We <laughs> was blasted. Back then, niggas was drinking St. Oz, smoking hella reefers. Not Please. me. <laughs> I wasn't doing shit. We was wilding. We was wilding. We was put like that. It was, we was, we was so we had know. so much fun in the booth Word. that Word. day that five started just wilding out <laughs> and, and going like this from mic yo from mic to mic and we going chill. Five, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna tell you what happened, right? Fuck that. First of all, 
like, you know, like I said, if you came to the studio, you was going to work that day. So I made everybody go to the vocal booth, and I was like, yo, five, I just need y'all to go in there and go, ho, oh, oh, at the end of the record. <laughs> Not five. Five goes in there, he pushes somebody, and he just starts wilding out, talking about, shit is mad real, what, nigga, what? And just starts, and everybody just starts wilding, and I'm like, yo, chill, five. Chill five, and you hear this on the record. And you see, you can't see, can't see five, but he's behind. I see him. He's going. He's laughing behind the mic, going, <laughs> "Why?" So and I'm like, "Yo, hilarious. five, chill, yo." But it, at the end, when yeah. I listened to it, I was like, "Yo, we can't change that. That is perfect right there." Keep it. We're gonna keep all of this. <laughs> all right. Title track. <laughs> Hey. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Word up. What's up? <laughs> Mr. Walt on the beats again. Mr. Walt on the production once Wicked. again. Wicked. You know, one of those tracks where it's like, you know, um, we going we going through the stages, man. That that you know, we going through the stages. This is real. You know, this is not um the days of shopping and demo and it's coming back of rejection. And you know that's that's what it is. It's like this is this is this is the, we made it, and this is nervous, you know. And this is this is the real deal. And the album is being done, and it's either going to pop or it's going to drop, and all of that stuff is going down and through the minds of all of us when we making these records and making it into the stage and to the stage of there. It's like that's you know it was like black we rock was, funk. We was trouble. We, we was blessed to have Mr. Wolf and E combined because they're two different type of producers, like Mr. Wald is a laid back, slow flow, ill, melodic, wicked, dark, you know, and, and he was more a uh, up-tempo, hard, heavy bass, bang out type of uh, producer, and their combinations in the music and how they put it together also was why the album sound mm -hmm. the way it does. I love the way those last two tracks go from one into another, right. they're almost it's almost like one song, but you know, broken into two. Okay, two more tracks on this album. This is the second single off of this album. How many MCs? Mm. Yo, mm. Mm -hmm. that was that was mm. that joint right there, man. You know what I mean? Um, you know, I don't like. I'm gonna definitely let E, you know, finish speaking. I just want to definitely say that that joint is. Even I think more special to me now, uh, because when we did that record, um, I always had visions of doing the video, my first video, or really doing my, the video uh, in the projects, you know, where I grew up at, and in the house and the family where I grew up at. My god, my godmom was like my she's my second mother um, every day, so so going over there to do the video was kind of ill. Uh, so I, you know, it's kind of ill for me because when you look in the video, we got all of our family right. uh, in the video. We that's all brothers and cousins and and everybody in the project. She she uh my mom my godmother mama Carol Carol Miller recently she recently passed. She would she always had that vision like you know what well, go out there and and really you know do your thing and. Man, you know, mama was like the mama for mama's house, you know. For real. Uh, so she raised everybody. Uh, so when I hear that music now, I think uh, I think I uh, think about that. I think about the fact that we was able to get it done, and she was able to see stuff like that happen. So it's even a little because that video, like I said, that video is shot in the place that made it all for me. You know what I'm saying? As a, as a person. So that's I think of uh, her when I think of it, how many MCs and her looking out the window. You know what I'm saying now. Yeah. Or, uh, that um, Mr. Walt um, put that together. Buck actually co-produced that because Buck was like, "Yo, I want to rhyme off a of Hydra." And we, me and Walt, at the same time was like, "Nope, nope, nope, nah." Grover Washington sure. Jr. Hydra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We was like, nah, we're not going to loop that up, this, that, and the third. And just 
I don't, you know, one day Walt said, you know what, man, we got to stop being stubborn. Yeah. Let's they, always doing make that, that happen. <laughs> <laughs> always doing that. No, we're not looping that. Come on, man. Stop playing. Loop that, man. But that, I mean, that's got the snap on the snare. It's got yeah. that. Dun, dun, dun. I just like that, the, horn, the whole thing. I added the horn. Me and Walt argue about this all the time. I added that horn. Walt always says I didn't. But I added that horn in there. And that little. Biz. Yeah, that's that's nobody beats the biz. Yep. Walt stretched it out the biz. Once mm. again, did it in the projects. Had on clothes that we wear every day. That was, you know, that was my thing. I really so we made my man Boogie Boogie Brown talk about this all the time. You know, I I, I think I was I was wearing the the uh, the, the pattern uh, Applejack hats with this with the matching. You know, I grew up in the, in my family, we always everything they was on some real coordination. Cool, coordination baby. stuff like my family. Coordination, so man. Uh, you know what I mean? <laughs> Kenyatta Blake is very coordinated. You know what I'm saying? Buckshot Shorty got a lot of Kenyatta Blake in him, but he also wild too. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. All right. Last track. It's a posse cut. Um I guess it's gonna be tough to well, we'll figure it, maybe after Drew's verse, we'll figure it out. So, you the man, last track on Into the Stage. Niggas get set it when they get ready with the automatic weapon. Oh, man, that was a posse cut. I know y'all can't hear this verse, right? Okay. Head up the hill, Havoc from Mark Mark Yeah, chill. that was Havoc from yeah, Mark That was Havoc from Mark, yeah. So, who, so but five starting. Drew. Ha, have. Have. Tech. Tech. And then, you know, still, still and then you. Buckshot. Yeah. Right. You know, it was our posse cut for the yeah. album. It was, yeah. it was the, it was our go all out song for the album. It was like, you know, it was close to rapping out and it was a fun song. And uh, once again, you know, Drew, um, Drew Ha, uh, who was, you know, my partner in Duck Down. Drew, when I met Drew, he was working for Nervous and he was, he, he was actually an MC. He was doing his own, you know, he had a, uh, Drew and the Mastermind, Drew the Mastermind. He had a crew his homeboys before, but when he was working with the label, um, he would always, you know, put me on to his MC skills and his and his talents stuff like that. And but one thing I respected about Drew is he had an ear for production and the mind. So when we did the album, I said, you know what, I'm gonna get everybody who I rock with that's cool with me to, to get on this cut. Right. And Drew was one of them, and I knew Havoc before he got a record deal. So um, me and Havoc used to call each other's houses and stuff like that. So when I used to speak to his mother, she screamed on me for calling him Havoc. But um, I, I called him and I said, yo, I'm doing this song. Can both of y'all, you know what I'm saying, come down, you and Prodigy come down and get on it. They both came, came down. Prodigy wasn't feeling too well and Havoc came down and Havoc um, did the verse on there. And um, it was special, you know what I'm saying? Because I come from Crown Heights, Franklin Avenue. Well, I come from everywhere in Brooklyn, but at the time, it was like really resort heavy. Where it's Caribbean, Jamaican, Trinidadian, Barbados, Guyanese, you know what I'm saying? I, uh, uh, you know, Haitian, you know, everybody is around where I come from. So yeah. all of that music is embodied in that song. I'm coming with the, with the, the Yardy style, you know what I mean? I'm chatting on there because I'm letting people know, yo, this is, you know what I mean? I'm letting everybody know that it's a universal take, lyrically inclined. Um, we got actually, now that we've gone through all the tracks, we got time, I think, for maybe two questions. Um, two here at the old end. questions. Um, from, right? Anybody? Two questions from the audience, who I think we could take at this point. Three? Anybody? Three questions all from the audience. Three so old questions. If there are three individuals out there who have questions, maybe somebody can find a microphone and. Get it to you, or you can just speak up and and Lights is tell them what happened Lights if you really come to my house. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, uh, my name is Brian Odin, BKO Management. Shameless plug. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, I'm from down south. Originally, I'm from Atlanta, um, and I, this is my first time in a borough, New York City, Brooklyn. Wow. And I just want to say, man, you guys' music really took the culture to somewhere else, wow, you know? Like, man, when I hear your yeah, music, man. I hear everything. Um, I used to go to historically black college and, and universities. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Um, around the same time your music came out. Was there um, like a plan and promotion that you guys set to like promote it at HBCUs? Or was it just some, uh, something organic? It was organic. Yeah. Everything was organic. Yeah, definitely organic. We didn't know about what a marketing plan is. Yo, my we whole. No, everything yep. was yo, radio, get the, yeah. get the DJ list. 
Yeah. Yeah. It started shipping. My yeah, whole thing was, it. it wasn't about marketing and promotion. It was about just making a good album. You know what I'm saying? We sat down, and I think that's one of the things about this album that was ill is we sat down and said, let's make a good hip-hop album. It was no, we didn't sit there and go to A&R. Like, and but and we that. was too young. Yeah. We didn't know about that. That's and as a matter of fact, we was, I was busy too much, you know, I was busy too much arguing with Michael Weiss because Michael Weiss was on some, yo, CNC Music Factory don't take this long to do a record. What you doing? So we was going back and forth doing that. You know what I'm saying? But we had fun in all the black colleges that picked it up, all the universities that picked it up. Um, they picked it up because it was an organic movement. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. And that's, Yo, and before, I, we, before we got a deal, we, 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 we loved the culture, what we call hip hop. We did that from graffiti to the music to the dancing. Like we did that with a passion. You know what I'm saying? That was every day. We danced every day. I mean, you know what I'm saying? This did music every day. We lived and breathed that. You know what I'm saying? Watch, we been fans of the music. You know what I'm saying? Since the early the the the, the, the early '80s. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't hard, really, for us to do what we did. Did we know that uh, it was gonna have an impact? Nah. You know what I'm saying? That was all blood, sweat, and tears and passion. You know, for to be a part of the culture. You know what I'm saying? There was, like we said, it was never nothing pre-planned. We didn't know nothing. What's a market and nothing? We didn't know to after the album came out and the and the thing that and the things that we had to encounter after that. You know what I'm saying? We were dealing with nervous. Then we started dwelling and getting deeper into the uh, 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 marketing aspect or the business. When I say the business aspect of it, actually, you know. Um, all right. Who? Two more questions. We got time for. Yeah, peace, DJ Cabin. Peace. What's up? Um, Hi. All right, what's up, people? Um, was, uh, you Buck just touched on it basically with like the Caribbean influence, but I was just wondering more like some of the cultural things that you were dealing with, like um, even just the language, how like it's I got you open, right? You know, we use the DA a lot. It's like a Brooklyn kind of unique look to Brooklyn, just like the Caribbean influence. <laughs> uh, this is like a 5% influence kind of on the first album. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Uh, Evil D's and Bushwick, you got uh, Dr. York and stuff like that. It's just some of the more yeah, cultural we, yeah, aspects of it, you know? <laughs> I'd be very interested in, you know? And, and if you had like an awareness if of you look, if how you big look it on was. A, if you look on the album cover, um, right? No, you can hand me, uh, I guess, the big one. If you look on the album cover, Five is wearing a six pointed star and crescent on the, on the album cover. Uh, that because that that's we we rolled in Bushwick. We was we was so we was moving news in Bushwick, so we we rolled with Bushwick. That's how we know a lot of we we connected with a lot of MCs before they were MCs like Jay Z and certain people. Jazzo, um, Jazzo, these people we Onyx. we Onyx, Onyx. These are the people that we was a part of uh, without without even considering music. It it had nothing to do with it. It, it just happened to be coincidence, so that was one of them. We always had knowledge itself, if that's, you know what I'm saying, pertaining to the question. Like, we, we did a lot of a deep study, and we were, we definitely were aware of, of, of the history, you know what I'm saying, and, and acknowledging of, of, of the struggles that our people's had to, you know, go through and experience. Yeah, we definitely, from that aspect, that we, we, we was in deep. And has a lot to do with the lyrics, too. If you listen to the lyrics, you know, it's like you hear some of the rhyme lyrics that just are rhymes, not even, you know, Pat or whatever, but those rhymes got certain flows because of the Caribbean influence, because of, you listen to some of the Yardies, you listen to some of the best tunes, nobody could flow like, 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 like you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, uh, the Caribbean <laughs> brothers, man, from all nations, nobody could flow like the Yardies. I mean, no, I, you know, whether they be from GT, Guyanese, you hear Sizzler, you hear Bounty, you hear, you know, uh, you know, just, Buju, just anybody, all, you know what I mean, no, not anybody, but all my dudes, like Buju, Super Cat, you know what I'm saying, uh, all of them right now, even Serrani, I mean, everybody got a certain type of, everywhere I go, you know what I mean, like, that's that. And that's, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? That's that soul. That's that, you know, soul music. I would consider this album for me is our soul music at that time. You know what I'm saying? Because that's what we was vibing on all the time anyway was the soul music. The essence of what makes that, like he said, what makes you want to clack your finger and feel the vibe and, 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 and the energy. You know what I'm saying? Pulling on and building on a certain level of energy. And that's what, you know, 
we did that naturally. And the, it was the blessing of being able to dance would allow us to, to, to deliver that energy through the music. You know what I'm saying? They work in hand. Like Mark Buck said earlier, when we write, you know, we listen to the music, we dancing. When the eyes is closed, the eyes is zoning out, we in the zone writing music. We dancing in our head. For some people, that's, I know this is probably irrelevant, but just for some people, they always ask me this question, why do I use my finger when I rhyme, or why do I, you know, do it? It's just because I can't dance any. I can still dance, but I can't. I don't dance, so I gotta dance this way. <laughs> and I, you know what I mean? And as I'm rhyming, I'm following my own dance steps. <laughs> you know, but, you know, so it's, it, was, it was definitely a super duper pleasure to be blessed to do Into the Stage as an album. Um, you know, uh, you know, last but not least, especially because Evil D know that we wanted this so bad, so, so bad, that at MCA Records, I used to take all of the demos that people didn't want, the garbage demos they would throw away, and I would take them and take all the stuff out of them, and I used to Xerox copy uh, my our own art, artwork and draw it, <laughs> and then I used to measure up the size exactly where if you cut it like that, when you fold it, it'll fit into the, oh, the cassette, man. so when you turn to the side, it'll look like Black Moon was written down by the computer. And, uh, I was really you know, crazy with it, and, I, and it, to, for it to actually come out, was like thank the creator, thank you. You know what I mean. I think we got. Do we have time for one last one? Yeah, one last question over here on the left. What's going on, Damon from Washington Heights. Uh, uh, what's up, Damon? So, when I got your album, I was in middle school, right. and if you had a middle school crew, and to the stage was your anthem, you you rolled to it, and I think really <laughs> what we, we related so much to it because you would listen to Buckshot Shorty, and we were used to everybody like, yo, Shorty, Shorty, Shorty. Everyone would call it Shorty, and we were like, yo, this is our champion right here. Word. So also your voice changes multiple times on the album, and our voices were changing at that time. So I just I want to ask sort of stylistically what you were going through between, like if you even listen to Buck'em Down. How nervous I was. If you listen to, if you listen to Buck'em Down between the original track and then the remix, your voice is deeper, you feel like a lot more. It's, it's, it's a lot more, I guess today they would call it swag, I guess. You but, know what, and that's you know. funny, because I guess, you know, whatever, you know, to, today, I often tell people, uh, watch, watch the two, because it's a real thin line. I got a homeboy who's a, who got us a son, and we were just talking about that some people consider, some people uh, replace swag with ego. Now, um, as it's okay to have swagger, but, and it's okay to feel eager, ego, but know when and where to feel and do both. But most people replace swagger or ego with swagger. So they, you know, that's, yo, what's up? Yeah, I know I'm nice, man. I never did that because the people is going to be the determination that the bottom line. So if you do have swagger, it should be, or I would hope that it's just a natural swagger. That means that, truthfully, I wasn't conscious of none of that stuff that you, you know, I, I knew that my voice was getting deeper, I'm getting older, but at the same time, I was, I, I was, I always had a older mentality. So when I'm rhyming, I'm not going, but I am coming hard like, you know what I'm saying? So I'm not really conscious, and I really thought it was a it was a, not a good thing that my voice was that deep. I, I, I was more on the negative side than the positive because I'm hearing other MCs and other songs, and I'm like, see, I want to sound clear like them, you know? And a lot of felt like a lot of my stuff was, wasn't that clear. So when the people said, no, we like that, I was like, thank God, because I swear it's, it's, I can't, it's natural. And you know what I'm saying? So that's it. <laughs> well, we got time thanks. for one last question, I'm told. Yeah. So one last question. So. My name is Chris Lighty. <laughs> I, try, I, I just want to know, you know, it's the thing that I hated the most. Uh oh. Okay. <laughs> let me prepare for this one. Cause I, let me. <laughs> Why? Why? Didn't you come to Def Jam? Yeah! Yo, we out. Peace. Thank you. <laughs> Oh my God! Woo, oh my God! I got a call. Woo. I got a call. I was at my house. I was, <laughs> oh, I was, I was in a room. I was, I was sharing a room with my brother. 
And I got a call, and I could not believe it. Chris Lighty and Def Jam wants to meet up with you guys. And I was like, that's, can't, that's not true. <laughs> and um, I was like, yeah, it is true. And um, we, we met up with Chris and... Um, Leo, we met up with Chris in Manhattan. Leo, and <laughs> um, it was raining that day. It was raining yeah, that day. Yeah, and we were sitting at the at a, at a dinner at a dinner spot. And to be honest with you, I remember as I go back to it and I think, um, instincts say cool, mind say what the hell, you know what I'm saying? Because at the time when I think about it, all I do, all I remember is. These guys saying, okay, so we're ready. Like, what you want to do, you know? And I just remember saying in my head, um, you know, I want my own, I know I want my own label. You know what I'm saying? I want my own label. And and the message, message kind of was like, I mean, Chris is right there. But the message was kind of <laughs> like, you know, we, we, we want to start with Black Moon first. And, um, you know, after we, you know, work with Black Moon, you know, then we could pick up, you know, that. And the crazy thing, the reason, the real reason, too, is because I was, I had heard that prior twice already. And I was like, man, if I can't bring Helter Skelter and Smith and West and anybody at one time, I can't do this. You know, this is the family. This is the crew. And, um, you know, uh, I actually... Just when I get into full detail, you know, I said, well, what about my own van? They said, well, you can have your own van. We'll get you a death van. We'll get you a van. <laughs> I'm like, but I don't want you to get a van. I want my own van. I want to buy one and it to be ours and we drive around anytime. You go hold In my head, I was thinking, yeah, you go hold it whenever you want. Man, I want our own van. I'm thinking there's a lot of other artists who's going to be like, yeah, we want. So it was a few of those things. And the bottom line was, you know what? Um... The biggest, the hardest decision, I don't even know when I think back to it, that was ever made. I said, I want to go there, you know what I'm saying? But if, if, but unfortunately, they won't, they, they want to take Black Moon right now and not Smith and not the rest of my crew. So it, it really was like, you know, biggest opportunity of my life, mm. you know what I'm saying? Mm. Um, biggest situation, the biggest label, the best individuals in the game, my crew. My family, my brothers, dudes that struggle with me. Yo, that was that what the hell what? do I do? <laughs> and Buckshot was like, I'm gonna go with my family. You know what I'm saying? And I and I will hope that I respect, that I respect, and I love the fact that I even had the opportunity for them to even consider us. You know what I'm saying? And I, you know, but the truth is, I can't leave. You know what I'm saying? I can't do that. You know, I can't leave my brothers. And Chris to this day always, you know, talk about how he respect that. That move and that that I made it was the hardest decision in the world. It's I swear to it's God, it's always been an independent mission since day one. You know what I'm saying? We didn't know how or what was going to happen, but we was like I said, we was exploring, finding ourselves and trying to find our niche on on, on and, and and take things in the direction where we can uh, build and get in, in, and express our talents and, and let our and our talents be known. You know. Took a you that turned out a deal from Def Jam. <laughs> Man, is you crazy? <laughs> Shit. You could have had a TV in yeah. every room. <laughs> Believe me. <laughs> that was divine intervention, man. I say that to this day, that was a divine intervention. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because we was young at that time. We well, was young at that time. We don't know what kind of record what would happen, but we do know is that into the stages this album that we all love and we're celebrating here today. Thank you. And um, I think we have to actually wrap it up. So if everybody can just say thanks again. Thank to you very much, man. Black Thank Moon. You. Thank you. Thank Buckshot, you, man. Thank Evil you. D you. And five Thank y'all. Thank y'all. Thank y'all. And we're going, and we definitely going to tear down the night. Air out the night.